Father, we come in the name of Jesus, and we realize it's only by your grace and strength that we're here. And we pray now, Lord, that you will bless on every level. Bless those who are hurting, those who are sick. Bless and touch those who are bereaved and suffering from the loss of loved ones, those who are homeless, those who have inadequate financial capacity to help to restore or to even give them the kind of life that is necessary in a time such as this. We just pray for everyone and everybody that you will fortify us and see us through. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. And we pray now, Lord, that each one of us will put on that whole armor and stand in the evil day and withstand and understand the methodia or the wiles of the enemy. And we claim victory right now in everything. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, obviously, I think the thing to do for uh, a few minutes here, and uh, uh, I'll have the clock running in a minute, so i make sure that I won't keep you too long and away from your lunch, and, and uh, after your lunch is over, to get you back on time that you might not miss anything. Uh, sometimes I can go on and on and on and on and on until everybody's dropped off except for me. But I won't do that today. I'll just get to the point. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of things up front so that we could get you immediately when you get on your lunch break so that you won't have to keep waiting and waiting for us to come on. So I wanted to go to Fortified Revisited. That's what I want to do today because I think it's important if I keep repeating this for us to get this because uh, the response is that this is nouveau, that this is different, that this is not what is usually done going into the new year. So consequently, I think repetition in this case is significant for the concept to be welded into your spirit. And, uh, and that is very simply that God's his word deals more with preparing, fortifying, strengthening, building us more than it is telling us about our circumstances being changed. Understand that. And that's why I'm urging you to grasp this fact that it's all about you being strengthened in your faith to handle whatever happens in your life because faith operates in the history of the existence and the history of the creation of the people of God. Faith operates in their history. The faith that brings them out of Egypt, the faith that brings them through the Red Sea, the faith that brings them through Mara or bitter water, the faith that brings them through the Amalekites uh, and uh, them being ambushed at Rephidim, the faith that brings us through the total historical activities of your life and my life. And it is not that faith is going to change every environment. Faith is going to see you through. Faith did not change the Hebrew boy's situation with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a point that I've made before. Faith did not change it. Faith brought them deliverance in the fire. Uh, and so understand this, God could have moved them away from even the fear of being taken towards that fiery furnace, which was heated seven times hotter than before, but he didn't do it. He answered in the fire. He allowed them to get into the fire. So again, when we go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, uh, verse 10, Again, when he says, put on the whole armor of God, and I'm giving you just a praise, uh, Paul begins by urging the Ephesians to be strengthened in the Lord. The passive use of the voice, it's the passive voice here. And what it does, it reminds the Ephesians that although this strength is necessary to withstand the forces of evil, it is not something that the Ephesians really do for themselves. So even though it's in the passive voice, you gotta, uh, the Greek is, is, is interesting because 
it's the kind of language that deals with great details in its presentation. You and I in English, we say, I love my house and I love my dog, I love my car. But obviously you don't love your dog the way you love your car, the way you love your house, the way you love your children, the way you love your children, because the language is not that precise. But in Greek, it is very, very precise. And I think that's why when the fullness of time had come and the Lord came into our world, he came into our world at a time where the language would give us uh, the capacity to grasp as much as we can the spiritual concepts that needs to be conveyed. And I hope that wasn't too verbose. He gave us a language that if we study Greek and understand how Greek interacts with New Testament concepts and salvation concepts and Christian concepts, then we can have a wideness to the language to grasp as much of the revelatory expressions that God is endeavoring to give us. So very carefully, it's in the passive mood. When he says be strengthened, it's passive, which indicates that even though you need to withstand the forces of evil, you can't do it yourself. That strength has to come from the Lord. Uh, one way of understanding this notion of being strengthened is for us to take a little journey into St. John chapter 15, where Jesus teaches us that abiding in him, the vine, is the only way to maintain the possibility of bearing fruit in an, might I say, otherwise hostile environment. Uh, you, 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 again, John 15 uh, emphasizes and corroborates my point of fortification in the Lord. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I am thinking we're going to be fasting soon. Sunday we'll announce a 21 day journey uh, into fasting and uh, I don't know how many of you fast uh, for more cars, more houses, bigger uh, houses, bigger land for marriage, for all those kind of things, uh, as opposed to fasting for a complete connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's telling us that our environment will be hostile. I don't understand why we don't see clearly that the kingdom and the world system cannot blend. What has happened is we have used the world system of wealth and prosperity and money, and we've made the kingdom promote world system reactions. I hear Christians saying all the time, we went, oh, of course, we went into the governmental system and we got involved in government so we could bring money to the kingdom. Uh, when does God need anybody to go into any kind of system in order to facilitate and give provision for the vision that we have? Uh, you know, nobody has to sell out, I'm saying. Nobody has to sell out in order to receive world money for kingdom operation. I, I want you to understand that. What, what did Abraham say? I think here's a good point. Abraham made it clear when, the, when he defeated the five kings and his partner in that defeat said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. Abraham said, I don't want any of the spoils and I don't want anything from you, lest you say that you made me rich. I think that's something we need to visit sometimes. He made it very clear. I don't want anything from you. I am not going to bow to you or I am not going to reduce my relationship with the Lord to believe that you are the one Who's going to make me rich? Oh, we're in for a ride today. So abiding in the Lord is the way in which believers may come to be strengthened by the Lord. So the issue here does not seem to be one of preferring weakness to strength or even 
of misperceiving the true nature of strength and weakness as in 1 Corinthians. Uh, uh, the issue is focused on where we find our strength. That's the key thing. And I keep hearing that my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for thee. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Understand the subtlety here. And that is that I acknowledge who and what I am. I acknowledge my weaknesses, but not only do I acknowledge my weaknesses in context of being strengthened by the Lord, I acknowledge my weaknesses and my helplessness. I think that's, that's, that's quite important, and I, I, I think I must make this point. His compassion fails not, and he gives us new mercies every day. That's in Lamentations, and I, and I think I have to exegete that. Compassion, his compassion faileth not. It is an entity that he has to have for us. It's one thing to have weaknesses. It's another thing to have weaknesses with helplessness. That's why new mercies. Every day he provides them because we use them up every day. I got to have some for the six. He's preparing some for the six because I'm sure I'm going to use all of mine up for the fifth. That's how it works. So the issue seems more than anything here in the text to know where you find the strength. So here is my struggle now. My struggle is to seek strength in God rather than in other apparent sources of power and security. I, I, I want to take a trip. I, I want to take a trip and uh, a, a little bit to Isaiah. I, I want to go um, uh, down to Isaiah chapter 40 just for, just for a little ride. And, uh, and notice how the Lord speaks. Uh, because I think it's important for us to understand that when we go into devotion, our struggle is to get into that place of God. Uh, we, and once we get into that place of God, his strength will overcome the enemy. This is an area that I didn't touch on when I exegeted this before. And that is this. My struggle is to get close to God. My struggle is to stay connected to the vine. That is the end of all struggles because once I struggle to seek to seek him while he may be found, labor not for the meat that perisheth, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, his righteousness. Uh, once that's where I, I, I struggle, I struggle to get into his strength. Once I get into his strength, the rest is history. I hope I'm making that clear. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling some resistance. Uh, my struggle is to get close to God. That's what my struggle is. And computer, please don't do this. My, my, that's what my struggle is, is to get close to God. And, uh, and it's imperative that I do that. Okay, my battery is up, so I'm good. I can't lose these notes, saints. Uh, it's, it, that's where my strength is. That's where my struggle is, rather. And that is to seek his strength to get close to him and let him take care of all the business. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He will direct thy path. I'm not going to read all of this because, but note it from Isaiah 40, 12 through and including verse 31. But I'm going to read a, a little bit here. And there's a famous passage here that uh, the late Bishop Charles Watkins would quote. And he giveth... Hast thou not known, 28, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Now, 
if I would exegete that, I would say to you, is is very definitely, we have fainted and we got tired. We've been admonished that we shouldn't be weary in well doing. In due time you'll reap if you faint not. Weary faint. Weary faint. You see the association. You get so tired you pass out. So the issue here is you're not struggling to overcome anything in your strength. You're struggling to seek the strength of God. And this is why Isaiah is giving him such great reviews. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here is what our devotions should be seeking. And here is what we should be going after. Not laboring for things that perish. Not going into heavy fasting and praying over a new car, new house. So this is significant to us. That our struggle is to seek and get the strength to run. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. So on the one hand, this would seem to be a fairly straightforward task. I mean... But on the other hand, the story of the people of God in the Old Testament is one of constantly seeking power and protection from things, protection from people, and protection from nations that are not of God. And you and I need protection from the world system that has now found itself into the church through the wilds of methodia, the deceit of Satan, who now uses whoever he can deceive into promulgating that message that is killing all of us because we're looking at things in our circumstance that, are, that isn't changing. With all of the highfalutin uh, prophetic utterances, we're looking at things that aren't changing. And at the end of the day, to change your environment, you have to change. You have to be fortified. You can change your situation of poverty, not by running down, giving $100 at an altar, or following some faith uh, 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 session that only feeds the pockets of those who are doing that session. But you can change your situation if you get somebody to teach you economic principles, somebody who's willing to invest in your ideas. That's what we need, that kind of networking. That strength that comes from the Lord that brings us into unity, using each other's strength to bring about the financial solidarity that individuals need to make their lives better and change their environment themselves. Not sitting in a bed, on a bedside, praying for somebody to deliver something miraculously to you without your involvement, without your discipline, without your labor. So when I look here, they have to be protected from things, from people, from nations. And the church needs to be protected right now from the world system that has engaged it. To the point where you can't separate state from church. And that's one of the things the Constitution was crying for. Because the Catholic Church uh, in the day when the Spanish, the, the British, the Portuguese, the French, and the Dutch had divided the world among themselves. It was the church that got with each and every king that they choose to, got, to get with. Henry VIII, what did he do? He turned around and started the Anglican Church because he got sick of the Catholics because they wouldn't let him do what he wanted to do. 
So the church was in cohorts with the social environment and was totally politicized by the, in the feudal system. And now what we've done is got real, Satan's got real smart now in America. What he's done is he's fused the capitalistic attitude of the American people with God's blessing. So the supreme nature, when I, when I consider it, I, I could say moreover, the supreme nature of God's power and strength is manifested in being nailed to a cross. So it becomes clear that this is a puzzling and even scandalous strength. How can strength emanate from a cross? See, here is a strength that is spiritual. Here is a strength that is coming from within, not a strength that is coming from without. Because from without, he's being nailed to a cross. But he's releasing power that could never have been released. Uh, that's why to the Jews, uh, it, was, it, it was a folly. Uh, no, to the Greeks, it was folly. To the Jews, it was scandalizing. It was scandalous because they never saw a Messiah who could go to the cross. Your strength is not always in things that are easy and things that are wonderful. If any man come after me, deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. We're not in a denying self environment in our churches today. We don't teach people to be content. We teach godliness is gain. And Paul says from such, withdraw yourself. This is the method of Satan. This is how he tricks us. We need our money to help our boys. We need our money to change the environment that we're a part of. We need our money to invest in people who are operating within the kingdom to better themselves for the benefit of those in the kingdom and those outside the kingdom who need our benefit. That's what we need our money for, not to prove we're greater than somebody else and to have the biggest house in L.A. or, you know, not to. That's not what it's about. King's kids are sacrificial like the king that birthed them. So now you understand scandalous strength and in, in which it might be difficult and even terrifying to abide. This is why the struggle is to abide. And he'll take care of the rest. So to stand against the deceits of, of, of the devil. Uh, Paul continues. And he says the believers must put on the armor of God. And, and the very notion reiterates the theme of verse 10. Uh, and th that is provides a suitable defense. God's armor provides that suitable defense for the believer. So the verse also declares that the struggle is against spiritual and demonic forces that are not merely indifferent to their presence, but also are actively seeking to deceive them. Uh, now I, I, I got to go to Corinthians. I, I, I've got a few minutes left. So, so in order to defend ourselves from this deceit, we have to put on the whole armor of God. We've got to have on the equipment of a foot soldier. Uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me just, just allow me. I don't normally do this, but, but, but just allow me, if, if you will, uh, so I can... Uh, Spin around here and have, have, have a little fun uh, doing it. In, in Ephesians 4 and, and 24, he, he says, be, in 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, if you want to ask me what putting on the armor of God is, it is putting on the new man, which after God 
is created in righteousness and true holiness. It is not contaminated by the fall of Adam because it is created. So now the renewing of the mind is, is critical and he does this in Romans also. And what he's saying essentially is what I have done in you, your mind needs to grasp it. That's why early in the book of Ephesians he tells them that I would that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. See, all of this is mind processing. But the mind is the intellectual aspect that grasps every bit of the mystical, the ontological, and the spiritual because it has to be processed through your mind, even your emotion has to be processed through your mind in order to change your life. So he admonishes the believer to put on the new self created in the likeness of God. Oh, I, I, I wish I had Patrick here today. In the likeness of God. In true righteousness and holiness. So putting on this new self is crucial then to walking in a manner worthy of one's calling. Walk worthy of the calling. And in order to do that, you got to put on the new self. You got to renew the mind that was controlled by the world system. It, it, it's so, it seems so clear to me that as I study this, it becomes very clear to me what my battle is about. So that's why in 6, uh, 10 and 11, we're putting on the armor of God and it's equally important to be able to stand firm in the Lord and against the devil. So throughout the passage, we've got this rich uh, description of military hardware. Uh, it is significant for the believers are not called to make war on the devil or any of the spiritual power. We're called to get the armor on. So although once a battle is joined, it is difficult to distinguish between offensive and defensive measures, it appears then to the believer, because uh, am I on the defensive? Am I on the offensive? Uh, I'm in the middle of a battle. I have to parry some blows. I have to stop some arrows. But I got to, you know, I, I've got to get him off, off my, out of my face. I got to get him away from me. And all of this is done within the context of the armor of God. So at the end of the day, the believer's fundamental posture in the case here is defensive. The devil is the one who's making war on the church. Uh, uh, let, let me, let me, let, let me just, I'm going to run the revelations fast. And uh, you can see I'm better at turning my Bible pages than operating this computer thing, uh, you know. Uh, Revelations 12 and 17 uh, it tells me distinctly and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her say, seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ anytime you operate within the parameters of the Lord Jesus Christ he's going to make war alright uh, for those who, who say, well, Revelations, Bishop, uh, is a little too far out. Come, come a little closer to what gospel says. All right. And I will take you uh, to, uh, let's see, Peter's before. Where is Peter? Uh, let me find Peter real quick. And then we'll go from there. And uh, what we want to find there, and, and uh, maybe I'd do better uh, turning uh, the pages over there than I'm doing over here. I want to go to 1 Peter 5 and 8. And, and please make notes of these because I may come back and exegete these at any time. Uh, Peter 5, 1 Peter 5 and 8. And notice what he, what he says here. Uh, uh, let's see. Be sober, be vigilant. 
because your adversary as a roaring lion walketh mm -hmm. about seeking whom he may devour. The posture that we have appears to be defensive. Why? Because as quiet as it's kept for those who want to go picking on devils and, and running after devils to try to prove how powerful you are so you're looking for a devil to attack, uh, you can keep doing that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm looking to get into that place where the strength of the Lord will handle the devil. Why? Because the devil is the one making war on the church. He is the one coming after me and coming after you. And in order to do that, he has got to come past our defenses primarily through deceit. I, I hope you see that. It's primarily through deceit, which means he wants to be in here with me thinking he is okay. So the two passages that I read, the devil is the one who seems to make explicit frontal assaults on the believers. In Ephesians, the attacks are cast as schemes. I hope you see that. Excuse me. Uh, as, as schemes or plots. The wiles of the enemy, schemes or plots. Not a bunch of demons, uh, uh, you know, making funny faces at you. Not a bunch of devils coming at you, hollering out. Uh, not a bunch of devils uh, 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 vomiting and spitting up and all that kind of stuff. No, Ephesians shows us that we need to put it on so that we may be able to stand against the methodia because what it obviously is now is scheming and plotting. That's why you got to be careful when you're sitting around with a group of people and they're scheming and plotting for a position or scheming and plotting to bring somebody down, talking negatively about people who are trying and standing up for the things of God, trying to expose weaknesses and trying to break them down and make them look as if they're not all that. Talk to me. Scheming and plotting. Methodia. Trickery. Deceit. So the implication then is the devil will rely on subterfuge rather than try a match God power for power. He says he can't do that. So what he does is, the, the thing is, he can't get in past the power of God. So what he does is, he gets in through deceiving us to believe he is of God. Do, do you get me? What he is doing is he can't, he can't get into the church by getting around the power of God. So he gets in the church by letting us bring him in. This is why I keep continuing to say to you, that false doctrine is the worst thing that operates in the church. False doctrine is the very worst thing. Because it's there that he manipulates to make us feel like where we are is where God is. This is why I'm saying to you, he can fool you in your environment, but he can't get in you if you have the whole armor of God. This gives you the fortification to deal with anything he throws at you. You need fortification when you get rich. You need fortification when you're broke. The whole point is, you're fortified for riches, you're fortified for being broke, you're fortified for everything in between. Because the fortification is you having the full armor of God and God is doing the battle for you. If this is the case, then, because he can't match him power for, power for power, the assaults of the devil look more like that than military offenses. As will become evident. This shapes the nature of the church's armor. And that's where I'm going next week. I promise you. I I'm going with this until we're fortified. And then I'm going to jump into back into John. 
uh, because there's so many nuggets there that I didn't finish. In addition, the church will need to form a wisdom that is similar to that called for in chapter 4. And I'm going to read it. I have a few minutes left. In, in chapter 4, I got to read it. I got to read it. In chapter 4, uh, 1 through 6. Let me see. Chapter 4, 1 through 6. Uh, that ye walk worthy of the voca vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness, meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Very important. Because this is where he slips in. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Very important now to understand the significance of this unity because all soldiers have to watch each other's backs. This is why at the end of Ephesians 6, towards the end, he begins to tell us, once we're fortified, we pray, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This joins the church as a unit against the principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. This is kingdom versus world. So you just can't open a door and let preachers bring world concepts in through the deceit of Satan over you being wealthy and a kid's kid is entitled. Entitled to what? You're entitled to what's in the kingdom. You're not entitled to what's in the world. You're two separate existences in the same earth. You got to understand it. That's why we use whatever we get from the system of the world to further the kingdom of God. But we don't go soliciting. Because then we compromise. I got three minutes and I'm going to pick up from here. And, and, and I'm going to pick up because before discussing the, the precise nature of, of the armor, Paul goes to some length to identify the spiritual nature, the church's opponents in verse 12. That's what he does. He, he does that for us in verse 12. And uh, I don't know, I should have stayed in Ephesians. And that is for the, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Now, here's what Jesus is saying to all of you who want to divide us in the church. He said, mark them that cause divisions among you. And he said, avoid them. Mark them. Why? Because they systematically break down the church's overall ability to deal with what is not going to be divided. Didn't you hear Jesus say? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan is divided against Satan, his kingdom can't stand. He ain't divided. He's literally driving everything crazy now. Because he's not divided, but we are. And in order then for the church as a whole. The evangelicals, the what you call the black church, the Asian church, whatever you want to call all of these separate groups by race. Now, ain't that something? Ain't that something? Where the evangelicals are fighting the black folk and the black folk are fighting the evangelicals and we separate from the Asians and the Koreans. And when we deal with each one of these groups, everybody's got a problem. That's Satan. Deceit invading the church weakening our power where his kingdom is not divided hear me we're divided against each other seeking position the disciples were the same way 
Didn't want Jesus to do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go to Zacchaeus' house. Don't talk to the woman well. Don't uh, deal with the children. Don't, don't, don't. And then we said, well, what were they doing? Sitting around discussing who is the greatest in the kingdom. That satanic ploy his deceit, his methodia. And we measure greatness in the kingdom by who's flying a private, uh, you know, $70 million jet, who lives in the biggest house here, the biggest house there. And we're running around like world folk comparing notes on material things and separating ourselves. Some groups can't deal with other groups. And if you see a vision by a particular group and you buy into that vision, then people think you're compromising. The devil is a liar. So now the struggle here, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against a group that's not divided. And so we need to get in the Lord. So the struggle here refers to a wrestling match. Though it can refer to a more general struggle. And that's where I'm going to pick up next week. But I want to read something for you. And, and this is in Corinthians. Where Paul has shown us a very opposite when it comes to how ministry and church operate. He says, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye may be exalted? Because I preach to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Now you may say this is extreme, but the whole issue here is he did not see the people of God in Corinth in particular as a means to exploit or manipulate. He would rather be in want and have another group of people supply. Because God will always supply your needs. You don't have to trick for it. And this is what Satan does. And if you continue in, in, in this. And, and I'm going to read it. And, and then uh, you read it for yourself. This is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians rather. Chapter 11. And I want you to read the whole thing. He says, he, he goes on, I was chargeable to no man because Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being, as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Uh, Achaia, yeah. Uh, wherefore, because I love you not, did I do this because I don't love you? God knoweth. Because they were arguing that he was either incompetent or he was not qualified because he wouldn't take their money. But what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That is the ploy, the plot, the deceit of Satan slipping into the church and making capitalism gospel and we teach it and preach it. So we're not fortified for any situation. I refuse to be pastor and be condemned by God for not fortifying the people of God through the word of God. And that's where we are today. And if you are under the sound of my voice anywhere, if you're there anywhere, 
I want to say to you, pick up that phone and call us. Somebody is waiting to talk to you with an intensity that you may not understand. They're so concerned about your soul that they want you to call them so that they can minister to you in a very personal, individual way to talk to you about the things of God, to explain and to declare to you that even in your weakness and your helplessness, he is available for you right now. Even in the anguish of your soul situation where you can find no peace, where you cannot lay hold on anything that satisfies that particular place in you that only God can fill, they are waiting to tell you exactly what to do. Exactly what to do. I need you to pick up your phone and call 844-267-7729. Pick up that phone right now. Go in the closet. Go into the bathroom in one of the stalls. Uh, go outside if you can. But just, it's beautiful outside in California, wherever you are. Put a coat on, a mink coat, whatever you have. And, and get outside. Put your boots on if it's snowing. Uh, if it's hot, uh, you know, put some shorts, whatever. Because he is looking at your soul. He wants you now. And if you feel that urge and that pull, that's the spirit of God drawing you right now. I'm telling you, this is serious business because we're living in serious times and we need to be fortified for anything that is to come. Child of God, if you're saved and you need strength, pick up that phone and call. If you need us to serve you in any other way. You know, when you call the hospital, they say, if this is an emergency, call 911. Or else, if you know uh, somebody's uh, number, uh, then you can call them. This is an emergency f for 844-267-7729. It's an emergency because once you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you feel that pull, make that call. And if you need us for anything else, email us at prayer at cityofrefugela.org. Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we release right now. We release the Holy Spirit into the lives through the very word that you have spoken. And I pray now that the word will generate faith and faith will stimulate a response by calling the number prescribed. And I pray now, God, that many, many souls will be saved today and whenever this broadcast is played. And we speak it now in the name of Jesus. Heal where healing is needed. Financial where finance is needed. Bless in every way. Give us the ideas, the creativity to gain that wealth. And I pray, God, that we will use it for the blessings of others and communicate it to others, that we will make our treasures in heaven solidified and sound. And I speak it right now. Cause church people to come together, regardless of denomination, so that we might have a united front against the enemy. For those who have visions of reuniting Korea, for those who have visions of saving the earth and keeping our earth from being dilapidated and completely destroyed so it's unlivable for our great, great, great grandchildren. For those of us who are concerned about souls being saved and people coming to Christ through the power of the name of Jesus and the reception of the Holy Spirit, bring us all together and let us share in those things that are spiritually strong. Bless every worker today. Bless those who came with us on lunch. Strengthen them now as they go back to work and we claim it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Now ways to give, of course, you know the ways uh, in person or streaming. Text to give 888-364-4483 and just follow the instructions. 888-364-4483 and of course the website cityofrefugela.org and, and the cash app dollar sign city of refuge la ways to give so that we can continue to do what god would have us to do 
We're going to do some renovations and uh, we're going to make some major moves in the years to come. And of course, I'm getting to that age now where the future, a younger man, younger woman has to be considered. And that means less money for me, but better for the church. And that's how that works. So God bless you today. Heaven smile on you. And remember one single word. Forty.